We've talked about how you know Boris Johnson has been treated with kid gloves, how his speech didn't say that much, and how it was potentially a bit inappropriate to sort of talk about how successful Britain's strategy has been when 40,000 people have died. But, and I don't normally do this, you have to give him a little bit of credit for what he actually said. And that's because he pushed back actually against the idea that we should immediately end the lockdown. And there are some pretty powerful people in pretty powerful places who are pushing for this to happen right now. Most notably, they seem to hang around the Daily Telegraph. Um, and so throughout this crisis, this has been most notable on their comment pages, and particularly with neo thatcherites like Daniel Hannan. Um, I want to show you a headline from a comment piece he did back on the 11th of April. So to contextualize this, this was the day after it was announced that 980 people had died in a 24-hour period when we were all sort of, you know, talking about how serious this was, how tragic this was, Daniel Hannan was penning this. It's time to start loosening the lockdown. It beggars belief, okay? But this push has now made it from the comment pages to the front pages. The front pages are obviously more important for obvious reasons, but it's also, you know, you, you see when something has become political common sense that it makes it from the comment section to the news section, and that's happening now. Um, so on the front page this morning, um, the Telegraph you know, had a headline about Boris Johnson being, a, you know, preparing to ease a lockdown and all the pressure there was for that. Um, but unsurprisingly, um, even though this is, you know, supposed to be news, not comment, it relied on quite a lot of misleading statements and misrepresentation. Uh, this particularly pertains to them sort of exaggerating public support for an ending of the lockdown. An opinion poll published on Sunday showed that the public is increasingly supportive of a staggered exit from the lockdown, with more than half of people wanting restaurants, offices, shopping centres and schools to reopen as soon as new infections decrease. Though a majority want sports stadiums to remain closed until there is a vaccine. Now you read that and you know, any sensible person reading that would think, oh, people, people are desperate for this lockdown to end. They want to uh, reopen all of these you know, unessential places, restaurants, offices, shopping centers, as soon as new infections decrease. And to be honest, we already know that new infections do potentially seem to be decreasing. That doesn't necessarily mean it's stable or that's a long-term thing. But right now, that, that appears to be happening, right? The problem uh, this is a complete misrepresentation of what people actually told the pollster, right? So the question only gave one option, which was more pro-lockdown than the one that, you know, we would reopen these institutions um, when infections decrease. So let's, let's look at what the actual poll said. So asked about offices. Only 18% think that once cases go down, we should open offices as usual. Right, 55%, a much bigger number, think we should, but only with monitoring and restrictions. 11% want to wait until we have a vaccine. We can also look at restaurants. So only 13% want them to reopen as usual once cases go down. 55% think they should, but only with monitoring and restrictions. 21% think that we should wait until a vaccine has been found to open restaurants. That's, that's 18 months, right? And you can see here, there's, there's two huge problems with the telegraphs framing. So first, these people aren't just saying they want them to be opened, right? They're saying opened with restrictions and with monitoring. This is not people who are gagging for everything to go back to normal, as the Telegraph headline writers seem to be hoping for. Second, if you're only given two options, which is open them when infections start to fall with restrictions or wait until a vaccine, then, you know, the moderate position is to open them when infections fall with some restrictions because waiting until the vaccine, like I don't think we should wait until the vaccine to reopen the economy, but I'm not gagging for an end to the lockdown, right? Um, Aaron, I'm going to go to you. I mean, what do you think is behind this? I mean, often quite transparent, but very manipulative attempt mm. to basically misrepresent public opinion to try and make it look as if there is a drive to end the lockdown when you know, no such swell in public opinion exists. Yeah, it's just remarkable, isn't it? I, I don't know if it was that data, but there was perhaps another set of data which indicates that I think 60% plus of people were effectively very happy for the lockdown to continue as is. I'm going to interrupt you, actually, because we can get that, that data up yeah. and then I'll, I'll go to your proper comments. So this was YouGov today. It's even more sort of striking piece of data than there was um, in, in that Telegraph poll I just pointed out. So they asked an even more sort of conservative question, which is, would you like to see a plan to end the lockdown? So not even would you like to end the lockdown now, but would you like to see 
the plan. Mm. Um, and only 32% of the public even want to see a plan to end the lockdown now, let alone actually end it. 63% think the government should wait until the situation is clearer before coming up with an exit strategy. So sorry, I just, sorry I interrupted you. I just wanted to get those, those no, stats on the screen because you referred to them. Yeah, it's really helpful. And um, what you heard repeatedly, I think yesterday I was listening to Westminster Hour. Um, uh, yeah, on from, purpose? On purpose. I don't know why I did that. I then tweeted about um, Lucy Powell and it got loads of retweets. And then she said, apparently I was dogpiling her, even though I literally repeated her words back to her without attacking her. Um, uh, and they were saying the sort of tenor of the comment you were hearing on that show was, well, oh, people are getting restless. You know, people want to sort of see an end to the lockdown. This is the most popular policy of the last decade. This is an incredibly popular set of measures. It's not popular because people want to do it. It's popular because people know it has to be done because we've seen 20, possibly 40,000 plus people die despite the lockdown. If we hadn't done it, it'd obviously be significantly worse. You know, the ballpark figures are a quarter of a million to half a million people dying if we did nothing at all. And so I agree with you, Mike. It's just another sort of instance of this is just completely detached from reality, at least with the Boris Johnson stuff. It channels certain national myths, you know, of the sovereign, of a certain class deference, which does pervade British society. I get that. But th this is just a complete, you know, complete detachment from reality. Uh, and what was really interesting was some of those numbers about, for instance, 40, basically half of people don't want stadiums and nightclubs to reopen until we get a vaccine. You're saying 18 months. I mean, it, it could be, I mean, a more. I think a more realistic number is three years. By the time you produce it, produce, you know, actually physically produce them, roll them out, everybody has a vaccine, right? We need tens of millions of doses. I think it's perfectly fair to say three years, two years, three years. Um, in which case, you know, that's 50% of people don't think we should basically have Premier League football. They don't think we should have people going to nightclubs. I mean, that's I mean, really significant for large parts of the economy. I mean, three years. I was just thinking maybe Spurs will have sorted out their back line by then. So I mean, that's weird. Well, I mean, the, the match. Well, this is the interesting thing. You know, I was I was go through Google Google News and you see sort of transfer gossip and all that. This player's going there. This player's going there. Are you kidding me? The second like biggest source of revenue for football club is gate receipts, and that might not be coming back for a couple of years. So it's just like you know, there's stuff that people just take for granted going back to usual. This is huge. And what's really striking, I'll finish with this, is that the every woman, every man on the street seems to be more in tune with that than political editors and, and people writing for the front pages of our national media. And it's really, really striking. And you have to ask why. I mean, so I, th I think I could take a punt at why. Um, the editorial direction of The Telegraph and The Spectator as well makes a lot more sense when you realise that who they're writing for is a handful of maybe 100, 150 people concentrated around SW1. And that's who they want to influence. And they wield public opinion a bit like a mallet to batter those people into doing what they want. But ultimately, that's their audience. And you would look at what's happening now. It's not damaging the Conservatives in the polls really one bit. You do have a decline in the percentage of people who think the government are doing well, but it's still above 50% most of the time. And you've still got relatively high approval ratings for Boris Johnson. But what's getting chipped away is the core of their ideology. And the core of their ideology, which says that it's fine for significant portions of the workforce to be living precarious lives, paycheck to paycheck, often getting themselves into debt just to cover the basics of living expenses. Well, that's gone out the window when you've got a three month mortgage holiday, you've got conversations going on about uh, reductions in rent payments and deferrals of rent payments. And you've also got a, uh, you know, very grateful society towards those on that sort of low wage frontline work in a way that mm. you haven't seen for very many years. You've got huge numbers of people turning towards universal credit as a source of income support. Now, universal credit being an utterly miserable experience, which would drive people into penury, starvation, and even suicide, well, that's okay when that's not your core voters. When you've got more and more numbers of people who were self-employed, white collar, doing all right for themselves, who are now turning to universal credit, which system designed itself as punishment for the crime of being poor, then you've got another problem. 
And then going forward, you've got, you know, what I like to think of as the Churchill problem, right? The Churchill problem is being a very good wartime leader, but because you've uh, overseen a system of government which demonstrates that it's possible for a government to centrally plan and run an economy during a state of emergency during mm. wartime is that it then undermines the claim that the government shouldn't have a role in the economy in peacetime. So outside of that state of emergency. And I think that this is where Keir Starmer is trying to position himself, but unfortunately he doesn't have a Bevan yet at his side. He's supplying those big ideas that he could then put into action. So he's got the soft left, you know, sort of technical procedural bit down, but he needs those big ideas because a time like now, and this is what I think Rishi Sunak is very worried about. This is what I think Dominic Cummings is very worried about. This is what I think arch Thatcherites like Daniel Hannan and Toby Young are very worried about, is that you've normalized the idea that the state can take a major role in planning the economy, a major role in supplementing people's incomes, and that the collective good is more important than individual success, success mm. and endeavor. So you've got the heart of their ideology being demolished day by day. And that's why they're so worried about the lockdown continuing. Because the longer it goes on, the more their foundational way of thinking is just crumbling away under their feet. I can't believe the crude Marxists at Navarra Media haven't yet said that it's just rich bastards that want to make some short-term profit. <laughs> um, because whilst I think, you know, your your answers were made way more sophisticated than that, the Sunday Times suggested it might be a bit more crude um, than we've all been thinking. I want to go to this article from the Sunday Times. Uh, they led with the story, Tory Grandis tell PM it's time to ease the coronavirus lockdown. Um, now, looking at the headline, you might think that's, you know, ex-prime ministers, big dogs in the government, people who, you know, care about the long-term ideology of conservatism, the kind of thing that, that Ash has just been talking about. But actually, it just turns out to be real rich people, right? Rich people with with no political, uh, you know, prot well, pedigree whatsoever. Let's go to the first quote from that piece. So the billionaire financier Michael Spencer, a big donor to Johnson's leadership campaign last year, said we should start loosening up the lockdown as soon as we reasonably can and allow the economy to start moving forward. We should really begin to offer a narrative of how and when it's going to stop. Steve Morgan, the former boss of the house builder Redrow, who gave one million pounds to the Conservative general election campaign, said we're actually in danger that the medicine, if you want to call the lockdown, that is more harmful than the cure. Now, some of our viewers who who follow American politics or have watched, you know, our previous shows with, you know, great guests like Michael Brooks or Sarah Jaffe will maybe remember this this comment as being from Donald Trump. So Donald Trump has repeated this so many times. We can't let the medicine be worse. We can't let the medicine be worse than the disease or the cure be worse than the disease, whatever the particular phrase is. I think they both say it slightly different. Uh, we can't. We're in danger of the medicine is more harmful than the cure. Apologies. Um, now, he, he is saying this specifically because against all scientific and medical advice, what he wants to do is get the economy moving super quickly, however many lives it cop, however many lives it costs, because he is desperate for the stock market to go up by November. Um, because he thinks that's going to be, you know, what wins him the presidency, and also because he's obviously in the pockets of of America's billionaire class. Now you've got people who have given a million pounds to the Conservative Party, who are getting, you know, big pieces on the front page of the Times or quotes on the front page of the Times saying exactly the same thing. 